Another episode, Underground Railroad Productions. This your host, Brother Rich, joined once again by the living legend himself, none other than Professor Griff. Welcome back to the show, brother. Peace, Brother Rich. It's a pleasure to be back, man. How you feel? I'm feeling great, brother. I'm feeling great. Looking forward to talking tonight. Uh, I've been doing, I've been uh, getting back into my meditation, so I'm feeling a little energized at this time, you know. That's good, man. I I got away from it for a while, but I'm getting back into it, so I'm feeling a little energized right now. So that's good, you know. Yeah, I have no uh, choice, man. I got the meditation queen sitting here, so yeah. Oh man, yeah, you definitely do, man. Shout out to yeah. Soleil, man. She she gets oh, it right. in, man. Shout out to that, right? sister, man. Yeah, definitely shout out to that. I seen some pics of y'all um down there at the um what was that the Malcolm X Festival in Atlanta? Oh yeah, the Malcolm X Festival. Yeah, we was we had came through trying to make some things happen. Yeah. Yeah, how, how was it down there? Oh man, it was crowded, man. But we have um, we went through a um, a cleansing ceremony. What I mean by that, it rained on everybody. Man, that sky opened up. <laughs> wow. We got we got we got drenched, man, from head to toe. Wow. Yeah, but it's purification, man. That rain and that fire and that rain. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah. that's what's up, man. So. Shout out to everybody that made it down there. I seen Blue Pill was down there. Shout out to everybody else that was down there in the ATL representing for the Malcolm X Festival. And as usual, shout out to um, the brothers and sisters who signed up to support myself and Professor Griff on Patreon. We appreciate the support. Uh, shout out to Aaron Ramesses, the brother with the book, Weird Negro. Uh, uh, awesome, awesome science fiction book. Big shout out to that brother. He's doing his thing. And on that note, I want to start the show, Professor Griff. I want to deal with some hip hop today. The culture that they say is the most influential culture in the whole entire world. We're going to talk a little bit about hip hop today, Professor Griff. I recently uh, purchased the uh, David Banner's album, The God Box, and um, it was a great album. I mean, great album from from start to finish, and I really appreciated it, and I enjoyed it. And um, I was thinking about the music that's been coming out lately. I thought about, you know, T.I.'s album, Us or Else. That was a dope album. Um, thought about uh, Fat Joe with the music he's been putting out with uh, Remy Ma. They, they they came out with some good music all the way up and some other stuff. And um, it seems to be, and, and I thought about recently, uh, Jay-Z just got $200 million to tour with, um, I forget, uh, not, not Rock Nation, uh, Live Nation for the next 10 years, which kind of surprised people because he's 45, so they say, wait a minute, Jay-Z's going to be torn at the age of 55? And people aren't used to uh, somebody that's popping, popping at that age, touring in the youth, uh, listening to them and everything. So I'm saying to myself, are we finally getting rid of this age limitation thing in hip-hop? Because for so many years, you know, if you're over 40, you can't rap. If you're over 35, you can't put out an album. You know, it's like you're supposed to just give it up. And all, and all the other genres, they don't do that. They're, they're um, you know, the Rolling Stones, they're 60, 70, and they, Cher is still touring. So, uh, I want to, and, and I thought it was the age thing, but then I thought to myself, Public Enemy, y'all, y'all started out real young, and y'all was putting out some powerful music. So, Griff, talk to me about what's going on in hip-hop, 
And it seems to be the older generation is really holding it down right now, man. Talk to me about what you think about what's going on in hip-hop right now with that. Yeah, I started noticing that particular. I'm not going to call it a trend. Um, I guess LL said don't call it a comeback. But, <laughs> but the um, the older artists have been out. I guess the little ones, of course, you know, when the big ones got removed, the little ones stepped in to run the house. And now the little ones and lost the damn key, can't get back in the house. You understand? <laughs> right, right. So the older ones got to come back with the spare key. You understand what I'm saying? Because, um, and I'm not ashamed or afraid to say this, um, I saw some of those, those concerts from a distance, from afar. And they're just garbage, man. These, these young cats just not willing to want to take instructions from older cats to at least develop a, um, a live performance. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right. Uh, it's, they're... they're, they're they stayed in the music industry, especially on the road. It could have been a lot longer. Mm. You understand? They could have kind of stretched it out a few more years if they had a live show. I haven't heard anybody say, I'd go back and see them again. You understand yeah, you, what I'm saying? Yo, yo, you're so right about that. Yeah, you, that's right. That's true. So, but now, but, you know, with the artists that were out back in the day, you could see Frankie Beverly eight times, man, and still not get tired of it. Um, Patti LaBelle turned 73. And she's still doing her thing. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I think you're right. This is the only genre of music that you have to retire at 35. Or you'll be you're considered a has-been or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, I guess rap used to be for young teenagers, man. But now people have actually made a living pay their mortgage off or um, student loans and all and send a couple of <laughs> children through college not with it. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But I think it's maturing is what we're looking at. The genre is maturing, finally. Mm. To the point now it went through all its bumps and bruises. And it went through the conscious era. It went through the, um, it went through the era of just kind of, you know, I heard it through the great fire era where you had to be there to experience it. Um, African tradition by passing it on word of mouth. It went through the thugged out gangster era. It went through the pimping, thug, thug life, pimping, I want to be a baller um, kind of period. It went through the homo thug period. Everybody want to be hard ass homos, thugged out homos. You understand what I'm saying? It went through, it went through the different periods. Now, I think, um, yeah, it's it's off its period now, and it's and it's matured to the point where it's we can respect it for a legitimate art form, and other genres uh, respect it because now you see some of the older artists coming back because you know it's it's it's, it's you know some of them songs are vintage, man. Right. Yeah, so I think that's just it in, in a nutshell. Not to say that we don't respect any era. Or we respect one more than the other. It went through what it had to go through, plain and simple. Mm-hmm. Well, well, why don't these young artists have a, like a stage presence? Like you, you mentioned artists. Like I remember watching Busta Rhymes in a concert, or watching DMX, and you and you felt their stage presence, and they really put on a performance. Why? What's wrong with these young artists where they don't have that anymore? Well, just speaking from a recording art, artist perspective. We knew this. We rehearsed the song before we went in to record it. These cats do just the opposite. They go in, spit shit up the top of their head, they get the track back, and then they learn their own song. Mm. And you never really get time to develop a concept since it's around the song because if the song has no substance, you can go on stage looking like anything and saying anything. Right, right, okay, okay. So it, it has a lot to do with uh, lending some credence to the effort that you put in the song you're only going to get out of it what you put in it. Mm-hmm. So a lot of these cats put no evidence in making the song, and it's like, I think I heard Yachty and one of them foolish cats talking about, um, man, that's the, that's the problem. You're old niggas, man. I ain't, I ain't spitting no, you know, 16 over nothing. I'm just going and just being me. Just, yo, just get turned up. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's their attitude, and I guess that's what you get out of it. Right. Uh. Well, well, in terms of, uh, you know, hip-hop maturing and the hip-hop blogs that are out and um, the culture of hip-hop in general, 
In terms of people like DJ Vlad, uh, I remember when I first, one of the things that attracted me to DJ Vlad's channel was his interviews with Lord Jamal. And this was before the police shootings really started getting televised on television. And right. this is before consciousness really hit mainstream, like, you know, uh, the Breakfast Club and Hot 97, and they started bringing in the Tariq Nasheeds and the Dick Gregory's and all. This is before that. Right. And DJ Vlad had Lord Jamal up there, you know, talking his stuff. And I was like, wow, Vlad got Lord Jamal up there. And I was like, okay, that's what's up. When somebody that is from outside of black culture does something like that, should that be... Uh, should we look at that and say, you know, yo, that's what's up, give them props for something like that, or or is that something that, because a lot of people look at that with suspicion, like what is Vlad doing bringing these, you know, whether it's Jamal or whether it's you or whether it's, uh, you know, polite on there, they're like, what is Vlad doing bringing these speakers up here? Well, how, do, how, do we, how are we supposed to look at somebody from outside our culture that makes a move like that? Well, Brother Rich, let's not be hypocritical, man. We've always brought people inside the culture that don't look like us. Blondie. Remember Blondie? Yeah, yeah. She came in from the rip. You, you understand what I'm saying? Average white book band. Elvis. Vanilla Ice. Um, Informa. Who's that dude from, from Canada? Uh, Snow. 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 Um... Uh, uh, what's this, what's the young lady's name? Oh, man, right on the tip of my tongue. It'll come to me in a minute. But the, Tina Marie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kate, and Rick James Camp. I could go down a list of white artists that have played some blue-eyed soul that we've allowed to come in to the culture in that, on that, in that doorway. The other doorway was the fact that Run DMC got down with Errol Smith, public enemy. Of course, I wasn't there. Got down with um, Anthrax. Uh, with Bring the Noise. Um, but we could go on and on. The fusions have always been there. We've always paired up with white people. That's, that's through that doorway. The other doorway, we had no other choice but to allow the writers and the photographers and all the people to come in and uh, give the chronology and, and, and photograph and record the chronology as it was happening of hip-hop, because we didn't want to preserve our own culture. Mm -hmm. So white people came in and wrote, because they were the ones with the magazines. We didn't have magazines. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that owned the magazines. Until, you know, kept the, 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 what's my man name out of Boston that came up with the... With, uh, Benzino. Uh, Benzino. Benzino, right. So until him and a few other people, it's like it was unheard of for us to document our own story and tell our own story, the story of hip-hop. So Ben Zeno came along and did what he did. It, was, it wasn't that they thought that our own clothes were too frugal with Damon and the rest of these cats came with, with clothing lines and all this kind of stuff. So we always allowed them in. You understand what I'm saying? Young people today just don't understand it. We, we went through a thing where you couldn't just come up in the party now. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? You've been right. coming with your black friend. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Now, there's just, it's just it's no boundaries. There's no respect in the culture. It's, it's, it's none of that nowadays. You're just kind of like, you can do what you want to in rap, not necessarily in hip-hop. You understand what I'm saying? But right. it was a thing where we opened the door of hip-hop. And we allowed people to come in and to experience Wow. You understand what I'm saying? And it was almost like a cultural exchange, uh, Brother Rich, if you could uh, honestly look at it. Like it was almost like a cultural exchange. exchange. But that was, the, that was the beauty of it. You just didn't come and take. You understand what I'm saying? You had to leave something also. Not necessarily part of your culture, which they did, because the Irish dudes came in, experienced hip-hop. They didn't know what to do. It's so all the fuck they did was jump around. That's cool. Jump around. <laughs> right. so that's fine. That's the way you're feeling it. Do your thing. We ain't got no qualms about that. Jump around. Do your thing. If the BC boys came in and did what they did, that's fine. We understand that. So when you talk about, we're not talking about cultural appropriation here now, Brother Rich. We're talking about mm. a cultural exchange. Mm, they okay. fused hip-hop culture into their culture, and they made it what it was. 
Nothing wrong with that. That's the beauty. That's the beauty of music. Music is a universal language. Mm-hmm. There's not one set of notes that only belong to black people. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, we do it the way we do it, but nonetheless, that's just that's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. So, so when young people see it today, i.e., they see me talking about uh, the culture, but they see me on an Alex Jones platform. Oh, they'll blast me, man. They'll talk about me from now on. Right. No, yeah, yeah. You understand what I'm saying? And after explaining to some of these cats, I've done over 4,500 interviews. You had to do interviews when you was coming up, when we, we came up. Public Enemy? You understand what I'm saying? We had songs like um, Prophets of Rage and Don't Believe the Hype and 911 is a Joke and Fight the Power. Oh, yeah, man. We would have days where we, we would just have press for, for the whole damn day. Wow. Photo shoots, press, next day video, next day most uh, press. Yeah, that's just a normal day in the life in, uh, of, a, of a hip-hop artist back then. Now, I guess they don't do much that, that much press because they ain't saying shit. They ain't got much to talk about. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, I mean, you could look at the, the, uh, the, the energy and the, um, and the thought that's put into songs and stage shows and this kind of thing. And, you know, I know a lot of these older managers are managing these cats and they're just shaking their head like, I can't wait till this shit is over. Wow. <laughs> I mean, listen, if you, if you look at it, Individuals are making money, of which you see all of the money they flash on the the videos and the YouTube clips and you know their cell phones. Uh-huh. Yeah, we didn't struggle and kick down the door and establish hip hop for you to come along and just take the culture and just kind of do what you want to with it. Now, no other people allow that. Hold on for a second. Hold up. Mm-hmm. With those brothers. At the uh, is a Hawaiian tradition. That all the men dance. What tradition is that? Polynesian. I seen a Polynesian wedding. Was that a reception? I think it was a wedding, right? It was a part of their whole ceremony. The men got together with the with the groom and they danced. They did this ritual dance. Can you imagine one of them cats coming in and changing, flipping that up? <laughs> they yeah. whip somebody ass. <laughs> you can't come up in there and change that. You can't do that with the Germans, the Russians, the Italians. You can't change none of that. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And and from the youngest to the oldest, everyone knew the same step. They had the same facial self expression, same body language, same intonation in their voice. That's tradition, and you can't change that. So it is with hip hop, though. These cats are coming. And they're not respecting the four elements, the five elements, pardon me. They're not respecting the rules that were laid down to govern the culture, man. Indeed, they're, man. Just, they're just not. Mm. Now, now, if, if an artist, like, the, there was a video that went viral this week, uh, well, a, a small clip of Kate Perry. You know, she got in trouble before for having, you know, for all types of cultural appropriation in the past. And she's uh, performing. She has a video out with Migos. Uh, you know, they, they they had a song, Bad and Bougie, and they're, like, you know, one of the top artists from Atlanta right now. And she looks absolutely horrible in the video with the way she's dancing. She's trying to keep up with the latest dance set. She's trying to dab. And it, and it, and it looks crazy. It looks, it, it looks absolutely, you know, like she's making a mockery of the culture. In a situation like that, if a, if a white artist... You know, they might offer you a cool million just to be a feature on their project. Do you see a problem with these young rappers going on these pop songs to get a quick million? Now, you know, I'm 25 years old. This pop artist offers me a quick million to appear on on their record. They might be in the cultural appropriation, but I, I could get a quick million and make something from that. So what do you think about artists that decide to collaborate with these white artists or these artists that don't have a respect? for the culture the way that, you know, uh, we should traditionally? Well, they're not looking at it like a quick million like you're looking at it. They, 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 they're truly not. They're not thinking about taking that quick million and flipping it and doing what you would probably do. With it. So I think the way we're thinking about it, we, yeah, we're thinking about it in a whole different kind of way, Brother Rich. 
Trust me, bro, they're not thinking like that. Um, but then again, even if it was just a quick $1,000 or $20,000 or whatever it is, um, artists have always done that. Mm -hmm. Have always paired up with white pop artists or rock artists or punk rock artists to kind of do their thing, man. And it's, it's just, just something about oh, other people learning your culture that fills your chest with pride, so to speak, man. If I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of times, you really kind of don't see the color. You know that person is white, but it's like, okay, someone else wants to, wants to come into the culture. They want, they want to learn part of my culture. I know um, I've heard some Muslims talk like that. And I just kind of shook my head. Talking about my Islam. Excuse me? <laughs> Black man is the original man. The maker, the owner, the cream of the planet Earth, all the civilization, and God of the universe. Ain't nothing yours. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They're operating on the periphery of what real Islam is, but they're, they're, uh, they're claiming in a heartbeat, Brother Rich. And it's not for them to claim. But back to your question. I don't think these artists look at it like that. I think they think it's music. Music belongs to everyone. Regardless of who this person is, yeah. And I guess a lot of black artists feel they hook up with a white artist. That's a come up for them. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. They feel that's a come up. So you know, but it doesn't it doesn't work that way all the time. Um, you should at least try to pick an artist that got some talent. I can't see anybody hooking up with somebody like Justin Bieber. And wanting to do it, uh, I just can't see it. I just can't. The dude absolutely has no talent. He's a cute-ass little white kid, that's all, with a little voice. But to command that level of attention and respect and all that, I, just, I can't see. Just, just maybe it's just me. I'm thinking um, to fill a stadium of 20,000 people, yeah, man, that's that's, that's um Prince's level, you understand what I'm saying? But we're talking about Justin Bieber. Right. So, no, I, I don't understand it. The, the white girls that are into this sloppy pop stuff that they do, so a couple of cute little songs, I get it, man, but I can't, I can't see 100,000 people coming out to see so-and-so and so-and-so. I don't get it. When the, when the thing went down the other day in Manchester, England, I'm, I keep hearing the name of the artist, but I, I didn't even know, what's her name? Ariana Grande. Ariana Grande. Ah, it's my first time even here. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. I just, that was my first time even hearing, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a concert and this young lady was performing. Obviously, somebody in the world that they live in knows this individual. Is. I have absolutely no clue. Not at all. But, if we were to push a button and call all the vibration of our music back in to the point where we own it and we benefit from it, there'd be a lot of people that won't be able to perform some songs, bro. Can you imagine that? Mm. That if we said we're going to take back everything that's ours culturally, there'd be a lot of people culturally starving from cultural starvation. Man. For real. Be because of the, um, the political climate, and Trump and everything going on right now, is it safe to say we're going to see more of uh, David albums like David Banner's The God Box and, you know, albums of substance? Do you think that's a, a, a something that's going to trigger more of that from the hip-hop culture? Yeah, if we're going to survive, we're going to have to put some substance back into the, the music. Or else we're just not going to survive because as long as we keep it where it's at, anybody could do that stuff, Brother Rich. Mm. Well, I guess the white girl the other night they couldn't prove that, but yeah, anybody can't do it. But I'm, just, <laughs> I'm saying to you, we have to upgrade it, so to speak. We have to raise the vibrational pitch in the music. You understand what I'm saying? To the mm -hmm. pitch probably that a David Banner or Sa Rock or Don Ruby Sailor or, or, or um, the talented Timothy Taylor, wise, intelligent. Um, on that level, simply because 
if we're going to put the essence of who and what we are back into the music so it can speak to our people's soul, yeah, we got to raise the vibrational pitch of it, man. We just we just have to. But once we do that, no white artist going to want to touch that, man. None. I saw a, an embarrassing rap battle. This white dude thought he was fly with little quotes about jail and trying to speak to black people's hurt and pain. This brother came up speaking some kind of shit and destroyed his ass for real. I mean, destroyed oh. him. I think you're talking about B dot. I think you're talking about B dot. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I see. So that. proven to these artists that it can be done if you put some thought into it. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But everything is popping fresh dough for these this generation now. Everything has to be quick, fast, super size me, my iPhones and I vibrators and iDis and iPads and i condoms and the rest of that stuff, man. You understand what I'm saying? We went through a whole phase of everything was being supersized. The meals, the malls, everything. And now it's into everything, everything personal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I think I think after going through the, through that through, through that phase, I think only then are we going to be able to get back to the whole idea of appreciating cats like David Banner that put out conscious music, solid conscious music. Let me be honest with you. Conscious music went through a period where the beats were so fucking whack. I don't know what you were saying. <laughs> I was not listening. Right. Why was that? Why was that? Because cats be focusing on what they're saying instead of how they're saying it. Yeah. You know, in reference to, to in reference to the music. And then at that particular time, uh, cats was really getting sued, man. Public Enemy, we got sued for $2 million for the samples. There's a lot of wow. cats not eating off that publishing, man, because they sampled somebody's, somebody's song. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So now you have to go back and actually trust the producer that got lazy and fat because technology became more advanced now. Right. So now right. the producer, lazy and fat, rather than trying to learn how to play an instrument, he relies on samples, and you're getting sued for those same samples. Mm. So, yeah. But you, if you, you think about it on a publishing tip, there's a lot of old school artists made a lot of money because I can't think of too many rap songs that actually came out that didn't have someone else's song in it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. If you piece apart those songs, there's a sample in, in most of those songs and somebody else is getting paid. Yes. Well, what do you think about, you know, at the same time we have a little Yachty and him saying what he's saying about not being a traditional 16 or, you know, that some of these young artists don't care about lyrics. You know, they like you said, they might be all about the turn up. Um, but at the same time they exist, we have artists like Kendrick Lamar that exists who had a number one album for, I guess, I think it was about three weeks uh, this year. He was number one on the Billboard charts. Is, do you think it's a contradiction for somebody to listen to Kendrick and listen to Yachty, have them both in the playlist? I mean, th- does that make sense to listen to Kendrick and Yachty? Can they both exist at the same time, you know? Yeah, the Fresh Prince, Prince DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince existed with the public enemy. The public at the enemy. same time, BC Boys and LL existed. At the same mm-hmm. time, Houdini um, existed with Salt and Pepper. And then they existed with Run DMC um, and Cool Mo D. You understand? At the same time, all of us existed with Luke. Shit. At the mm. same time, all of us existed with Luke at NWA. Right. We're the ghetto boys. You understand what I'm saying? Right. And then Coolio and, and some of the other artists. So, yeah, we could all coexist. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the beauty of it all. We offer one another a delicate balance. Mm-hmm. But you don't have that today. Everybody sound alike. I don't know too many of them that don't. I don't know who from who. Oh yeah, Yachty, you got orange braids or something. Red, I don't even know them apart. I can't. Yeah, unless you actually follow them. Yeah, but musically, you knew an Earth Wind and Fire man from 
from Frankie Beverly. You knew Frankie Beverly and Maze. You you know the difference between them and James Brown or Lakeside or Confunction or you understand what I'm saying? It was, it was a lot of a lot of the bands just had their own unique individual sound, and that's one thing you try to develop with a sound. These cats nowadays. Yeah, uh, like that shit. I put up something. I get turned up, but yeah, okay, I got you, bro. You know? <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. Well, you know when, when hip hop first, when rap first came out, um, a lot of the older cats, the older generations, used to call it noise. And I guess we doing the same thing and calling Little Yachty's music noise. So are we, you know, pretty much treating him the same way they treated? Hip hop when it okay. first started. Okay, but let's let's look. Let's look at what they called noise. What, what what were they calling noise? You you could name some of the early songs. That was not noise. You understand what I'm saying? And if you you copied somebody else's rhymes or style, you straight up got your ass what physically. Right, right. And I seen it happen. Nah, you could not sound like somebody else. I remember Karen was one crew, they used to just come and take the mic from your ass. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, right. for real, man. So, but back in that, in, in those days, in a real, at a real hip hop show, at a real hip hop party, yeah, man, I felt so sorry for, for PM Down. I, yeah, I was just like, wow. Why oh, yeah. This dude, this dude, man. Long dresses and stuff. I was flowers in their fucking hair. I don't know, but it was ugly. No, what, what, what was they saying? Um, it's my turn. I'm like, yo, <laughs> yo, they just took the mic from the dudes. Look, get the fuck off stage. Let me get the fuck out of the city. <laughs> we can appreciate it now, but yeah, hip hop was just something else to contend with, man. You understand? Because we had to, we had to establish it. Mm-hmm. Now. Yeah, man, they just, yeah, you can't, you can't, yeah. It's, it's, it's hard for the older cats, like Ice-T, to look at her. What's the Super Soaker dude name, Superman dude? Um, oh, what is it? I forgot the little young boy name, man. But um, the dude with the Super Soaker, that hole, what, oh, what's the name? Uh, uh, Soldier Boy? Soldier Boy. Right, right. I can't see how anybody could... You talk about any old school artist, man, after we don't pave the way and establish a platform for them dudes to operate from. Mm-hmm. Where's the gratitude and the thanks? Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? I think Dre, one of them, made a song. Um, said um, he started this gangster shit, and it's the thanks I get. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right. So, yeah, we just, we just, you know, we got to pay homage up, man. Not necessarily got to pay it down. You got to pay it up. We respect some of these cats and their art form and what they're doing, man, but come on, bro. Respect mm-hmm. the culture. Indeed. Not the individual in it and that established it. Respect the, respect the culture, man. Indeed, indeed. I got, I got one more question for you, Professor Griff. What uh, do you try to, do you still try to reach out to, uh, when, you, when you see young brothers rhyming, like let's say Little Yachty, I don't want to keep mentioning his name, but just the younger brothers, if you run into them, do uh, you or maybe Chuck, do y'all try to reach out to them or it's pretty much to the point where if, if you give them advice or say something against what they're doing, you're just considered a hater. So you just like, man, fuck it. They're just going to say I'm hating if I say something, so I'm just not going to say anything. Yo, surprisingly enough, man, I might be having a conversation with Yachty. I met his dad the other night. Yeah, I heard his dad. Oh, what's up with his dad? I heard he was like kind of pro black or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. His dad is cool. I met him at the Eric Badu concert, man. So I might be having a conversation with, him, but it's it's one of those things where they look at it. It's like it's their time now. We've had our time, so right. Okay. Yeah, and and I think that's how they're looking at it. They don't want anybody to come uh, take them off their course and their path and what they what they feel they want. And I and I would never do that. Do your thing, but no one understands you got to be responsible. What you're saying, what you put out there, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's just that's just real. That's mm-hmm. that's real. If you if you a lecturer, if you if you if it's just going in in line with the griots, just you know the storytellers, the mm-hmm. storytellers coming out of the village, you just can't tell any story. Drumming circles 
if you play certain patterns on the drum, that can alter somebody's life. You know what I'm saying? There's a right. penalty to pay for that. So we have to understand, we have to understand the severity of it and get these young cats to understand that. And there ain't nothing wrong with dropping a seed every now and then on something positive. You tell me you got 10 songs in your album and all of it is about just getting turned up? Come on, man. Nah, that's like you, your whole life, all you eating is cereal. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? There are yeah. different dishes that you can eat. So, yeah, man. I, 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 and I think it's just, it's just, it's just maturity. The, the young uh, cats that are coming up today, they're not going to be the same cats in a minute because they're not going to come up after them. You're, you're going to want, want them, that next generation to respect what's going on now. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Well, um, well on that note, Professor Griff, uh, why don't you leave your contact info for the people Anything you got coming up, let them know what's going on so they can get in touch with you. Okay, my phone number is 678-557-2919. If you want to register for my online class starting June 6th, um, it's just simply entitled uh, Know Thyself. Just giving people a firm foundation on what it is to actually obtain that particular knowledge to have knowledge itself. It's a four-week class every Tuesday from, um, uh, I believe it's from 8 to 10, um, and just, just kind of slowing people down, sitting them down and saying, listen, this is the information that you need to have to obtain the knowledge yourself. So once we have a knowledge yourself, a lot of the debating, arguing, fussing, fighting, and not sure when white people want to interject something, like, for example, they just said Pluto just doesn't exist anymore. It's just it's not a planet anymore. It's just, we're just going to act like that's just not like not a planet. Like, okay, it's just, yeah. Well, we'll put a napkin over and just act like it's not even this. Stop that, man. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Or this dumbass yeah. flat earth theory. <laughs> or some of this other stuff. <laughs> if you had a knowledge yourself, you can't pull that okie doke on over on us that no. You understand what I'm saying? Right. And then, why would someone like Chancellor Williams or Dr. John Henry Clark or Ennis Wilson or any of these brothers and sisters sacrifice their lives and leave the work for us to build off of, and we ignore it. It's there. We need to put it in a functional, underlined the word functional, curriculum to the point where young people can grasp it, young people can respect it, old people can re- be reminded of it, and the people that are in the now, we need to get them to know. We need to get them to know. Some of the things that are going on happen in history already, but we, we can't recall because we're operating from not from our own minds. We're out of our damn minds. Somebody else's mind is in us. So we need to, to get this knowledge itself. So I'm giving an online class every four, uh, four uh, Tuesdays in June um, from 8 to 10. If you want to sign up, just go to www.professorgriff.me or just give me a call, 678-557-2919. This Sunday... I'm going to be in New Brunswick, New Jersey. I'm going to put the flyer up on my Facebook page, and I'll send it to you also. I think you already have it, Brother Rich. Um, yeah, I'm headed towards the West Coast, hopefully beginning of June. But June 25th in Lanham, uh, Maryland, I'll be at the Dragon Academy. I wish I had that phone number and that, that, uh, <laughs> the address of the Dragon Academy. But I'll put, the, <laughs> I'll put it up on my Facebook page. It's the Dragon Academy in Lanham, Maryland, let me see. Dragon Academy of Martial Arts, Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Yoga, self defense, fitness, yada, 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 whoop, whoop, whoop. It's 8807A, Annapolis Road, Atlanta, Maryland. You can go to uh, the dragonacademy.org website, or you can go to my website, professorgriff.me, if you want to register um, for the lecture I'm going to give called The Art of War. I'm going to piece, a, piece apart that particular uh, discipline has been passed down through tradition and through the families. Now that we have to go back and study it to give our young people and that generation coming behind us the discipline that guided us through the madness, Brother Rich. Mm-hmm, indeed. So, yeah. So, the Art of War in Atlanta, Maryland on June um, 25th, man, if anybody is uh, out there that's interested. All right? I really appreciate you once again, Brother Rich, for making it happen. 
I don't know, I don't know how many we put behind us, man, but we skipped a few, but uh, it was very necessary. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah, because I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, man, just to talk about another bombing, to talk about another Trump incident, I don't care if it's Melania slapping him or whatever. <laughs> it's just it's critical, man. That cat's forever going to be in the news, man. Yeah, <laughs> For real. Every, every week. Every, <laughs> yeah, every week this dude doing something stupid, man. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, I definitely appreciate you coming on the program once again. Thanks to everybody for tuning in and listening. And uh, we're going to see you next week, family. We signing out. Peace. 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 Peace, family. This is Brother Rich from UGR, urging all my viewers and subscribers to help support the channel by donating just $1 to the UGR PayPal account. We appreciate the viewership and support, and we understand the power of a dollar. If you benefit in any way, shape, or form, we ask that you donate a dollar, whether it be monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, or yearly, so that we can build our brand to compete with the NBCs, the MTVs, and the Foxes of the world. I figure since Kanye can ask Mark Zuckerberg for $1 billion, I can ask my subscribers to donate $1 so I can make the best possible content possible. The main objective of this channel is to inspire you to become the greatest version of yourself. So hopefully throughout the years of you watching this program, you have been inspired to become the greatest version of yourself. If you would like to donate, you can go to www.paypal.com and send a donation to richandmerit7 at yahoo.com. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your program.